Lord be with you. Welcome to this, uh, what may be for now anyways, our last of our um, online services like this. It's the third Sunday after Pentecost today. Uh, and we're going to start, well, we started last week, but I was on holidays, uh, reading from the book of Romans in our epistle reading. We're going to work on a bit of a, a sermon series kind of thing here, taking some themes out of those readings from Romans, and especially considering them in light of uh, what God has done for us in and through baptism. But I'll talk more about that um, in the sermon this morning. Uh, as I said, this uh, is more than likely, for now anyways, the last of our uh, online services because we're going to begin having services again uh, in person at Redeemer and at Christ our Savior next Sunday, June 28th. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and switch the service times. Would have normally happened the first Sunday in July, but we'll go a week ahead uh, of schedule. And the services will be at the service will be at 9:15 at Redeemer next Sunday, 11:15 here, uh, and you're able to come and be in the building. For that. Uh, there will be a bunch of uh, precautions that we'll be taking in order to make that safe for us to do, uh, and you'll be receiving a letter in the mail. Maybe you possibly have received it already, but more than likely it'll come uh, early this week explaining to you how that's all going to work. Uh, but uh, no sooner had I written that letter than things kind of changed a little bit. Uh, we had been planning, and I indicated in the letter, uh, that we would be singing hymns and things like that like we normally do. Uh, but information from the government that we received since then uh, made it clear they would really us, rather us not do that at this point. So we're not going to be singing or anything. Uh, but So that ch that's one change to what you'll find there in that letter that should be coming into your mailboxes here soon. Uh, but a couple other things, you know, we'll, we're strongly encouraging that you wear a mask. Um, th that's not so much uh, to keep you safe as much as it is to keep everybody else around you safe. That's what the masks are really best for. Uh, so I uh, recommend considering it a way that you can love your neighbor as yourself by putting on that mask and keeping it on uh, throughout the service uh, to protect others around you and keep them safe, even if it's uncomfortable and all these things. Um, that's what we'll ask you to do as you come back to church. Um, a couple other things about coming back to church. For the first thing is if, it's, if you're not ready to do that yet, uh, if you're not comfortable being in groups, being in a space like this right now, uh, that's okay. We're, they're not opening up and having services again in order to pressure you to come. If you're not ready, then, th then just wait. We'll continue to record the sermons, not the whole service, but the sermon, so you can hear the sermon uh, that way. And there's other ways we can, we can make do for now um, if you're not quite comfortable coming to church yet. So uh, don't feel pressured or anything like that, that's for sure. Uh, and then finally, with coming back to church here, we had been talking about doing kind of a food drive, having drivers go out and collect food so we could donate it to the food bank. Um, now that things are opening up a little bit, it seems less necessary to do the driving around and picking up part, uh, but we should still support uh, those who are in need in the midst of this ongoing situation, so I thought we could uh, instead bring our food bank donations here to the church, or well, here or to Redeemer, for that first service next Sunday, kind of as a, as a thank offering, giving thanks to God for what he's done, keeping us safe thus far through this pandemic and, and in all things. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you have items that you could donate to the food bank to bring them with you next Sunday uh, as we have that first service back again and we give thanks to God uh, for his goodness and his mercy in these days. So that's all a bit of stuff about uh, coming back to church next week. A um, couple other things. We are going to have Bible study this week, this Wednesday, 7 p.m., still online, Zoom, all that kind of stuff. We'll have Bible study this week and then next week, and I think after that uh, we'll leave it for the summer. Um, and, and it's a good, we'll, we'll reach a good spot in Acts, I think, to, to stop for now. Uh, and also, this would be, happens to be Father's Day as well, so happy Father's Day to all of you to whom that applies. We give thanks to God for you today, uh, but especially we give thanks to God that He is our Heavenly Father, uh, and we rejoice in that, not just this day, but, but every day. 
Then there's just one more thing that I'll mention, and it's in addition to our prayers. Uh, we'll pray uh, for Helga Vander Hayden, one of our shut-ins from here at Christ Our Savior. We found out this week that she's uh, at West Lincoln Hospital in Grimsby. Um, as far as I know, nothing too serious. I don't have a lot of information on what's going on, unfortunately, but, um, but definitely worth keeping her in your prayer. So I encourage you uh, to do that, and we will keep Helga in our prayers this morning as well. That is everything I have to say before we get started. Um, so let's sing our opening hymn, which is number 605 in the order of service, Father Welcomes. We continue with Confession and Absolution on page 2 of the Order of Service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment to silently reflect on God's Word, especially the Ten Commandments, and consider our lives in light of them. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. 
so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, Keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday after Pentecost is from Jeremiah chapter 20. O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior, Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Romans chapter 6. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under, under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is on page 5 in the order of service. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. How are you guys doing? Good. Good, good. Good, very good, very good. So this is one of the last one of these video children's messages we're going to do for a little while. So can we wave one more time to our friends at home? Wave to everybody at home. There we go. All right. So uh, it's la we're going to be back to regular church again next week. That's kind of exciting, isn't it? To have people in church with us, not be here by ourselves. That'll be nice, huh? But I, before we do that, I want to say thank you to you guys for doing all these children's messages with me all by yourselves and answering all my questions. The people at home I know really like that you've been doing that and they said lots of people have been telling me how nice it is to get to see you guys. So thank you guys, all three of you guys, for doing the children's messages with me, okay? Um, so this weekend there's a special day, right? Yeah. What special day is this weekend? We're recording this on Saturday, but what day is it tomorrow? On Sunday, it is Father's. Father's Day. Okay, there we go. You almost forgot, huh? Good thing I reminded you guys, eh? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so it's Father's Day today. The people watching the video, it's today. But for us, it was tomorrow, right? It's Father's Day. And what, what's, what's Father's Day about? Being thankful for our fathers. for our fathers, for our dads. Yeah, God gives us dads to take care of us, and it's a pretty special thing. But we especially, we especially remember that who is our heavenly father? God. God is our heavenly father. We have a very special prayer that we say in church called the Lord's Prayer. Does anybody know how it starts? Mm -hmm. Our father. father, our father who is in 
heaven. heaven. Yeah, our yeah. Father who is in heaven. He, he is our, our real Father. We're happy, to, we're thankful for all of our fathers, but do our earthly fathers, do they make mistakes and mess up sometimes? No. I know, yeah. dads never do? Dads yeah. never mess up? Do dads mess they up do sometimes? Mess up. Yeah, dads do mess up sometimes. Dad does make mistakes sometimes, and dad does things wrong and things that aren't good. But does God, our heavenly father, does he make mistakes? No. His love for us is always perfect. Just perfect. Because he is God who doesn't sin and who loves us all the time. And we're, talking, we're going to be talking in church the next little while about baptism. And baptism is how we know that God is our Father. Because when each of you guys got baptized, and when I got baptized, we became children of God. God. And so we can call God our Father. So let on this Father's Day weekend, we say thank you for our dads, but we also say thank you for, especially for God being our Heavenly Father. So let's pray and say thank you for that, okay? Dear God, thank you for our fathers, our dads. Uh, they are special people for us and they take care of us. But also thank you for being our heavenly father, our perfect dad who always listens to our prayers, who loves us so much that you sent Jesus to die and rise again and who is going to give us eternal life. We thank you also for all these video services we've been doing and pray that you'll be with us when we come back to church together again uh, and get to hear your word with all of our friends. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Dad. All right, we've got to wave goodbye to everybody at home. Bye-bye. Bye. Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Two weeks ago, 
on Trinity Sunday, I preached a sermon to you about how through holy baptism, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are continually doing the very same thing they did when they made the heavens and the earth, the very same thing they are recorded as doing in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, namely, making something out of nothing as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, he said. What God did then, he continues to do today, and he does it, in particular, through the water of holy baptism. As I wrote that sermon a few weeks ago, however, I realized that I would not have time within a single sermon to fully unpack what that means, what it means that God continues to make something out of nothing through the water of holy baptism. There was too much to talk about, too many avenues to explore, and not enough time to do it unless I preached a 45-minute or perhaps even longer sermon. But as I realized this, I took some comfort in knowing that in the weeks that followed after Trinity Sunday, today and in the weeks to come, that we would be reading from Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. Because those readings and those chapters, which we're going to have, we have start today and carry on over the next few weeks, they are going to allow us to pick up that baptismal theme again and to explore a little deeper the, the wonders of what God has done for us in and through our baptism. And so today and over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to ponder what we began pondering on Trinity Sunday and ponder what exactly it is, what this something is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit has made us to be through the water of our baptism. Now, at first glance, our epistle lesson for today from Romans chapter 6 might not seem to say much of anything about baptism. But if we back up a little bit and kind of take a run at this reading, taking into consideration the, the context, the verses that come before it, we can see that this reading is, in fact, all about baptism. If we back all the way up to the beginning of Romans chapter 6, our reading today started in chapter 12, or verse 12 of chapter 6, so we take it back to, to verse 1, of chapter 6, this is what we find the Apostle Paul saying. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's the first four verses of Romans chapter 6. And these verses, these words, are clearly about baptism. In four verses there, we had three explicit mentions of baptism. And Paul tells us here quite clearly that in and through holy baptism, God is actively doing something. This means that baptism isn't just some empty ritual that we go through or that we put our children through in order to celebrate the fact that we are Christians or something like that. Not at all. Baptim baptism is anything but empty. And it's not just a ritual. In and through baptism, God does something. And Paul makes a point here of telling us exactly what that something, or at least part of what that something is. Paul says here in these first four verses of Romans chapter 6 that through baptism, God has put us to death. You could even say that God has killed us. 
Listen to what I just read to you. Paul writes, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him, with Jesus, by baptism into death. In our baptism, God has put us to death. He's drowned us. Drowned our old sinful self in the water. All of us who have been baptized have been baptized into death and we have died. But that's not all that God has done for us through baptism. It's not just that he's just put us to death. If that was all it was, then it would hardly be good news. And it would hardly be making something out of nothing. It would just be more nothing, the nothing of death. But Paul points out here that God has, in fact, put us to death and buried us with Jesus. And having put us to death and buried us with Jesus in and through our baptism, God has, in fact, already, right here, right now, raised us up. So that with Jesus, right here, right now, we have a new life. We've died in baptism, and we've risen from the dead. And it's that new life that brings us to verse 12 in Romans chapter 6, where our reading for today starts. Because Paul talks about this new life that we have, this new life that we walk in, and he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Paul calls us here to live in this new life that God has given to us in our baptism. Through baptism, we've died to sin, we've risen from the dead, and we have a new life. And in this new life, we are called to struggle against sin, to not let sin reign or rule in our bodies. Even though we've died to sin and we've risen again to live to God, sin does still remain in our mortal bodies, and it will remain there until the day we die or until the day Jesus comes again, whichever happens first. But our calling as Christians, as those who have been baptized into Jesus, who have died and risen with Jesus, is to struggle against that sin and to not let it rule or reign over us in our lives. I recently heard a pastor compare this uh, new life that we have in and through our baptism to a, a freshly weeded garden. As many of you who have gardens undoubtedly know, the weeds never really seem to end. One day you make that effort, the gargantuan effort, to go out and weed the entire garden And it looks great when you're finished, because all the weeds are gone. But inevitably, within a day or so probably, new ones start popping up from the ground. And those weeds, just like the other ones, will need to be pulled, or they will eventually take over the garden and reign over it. And if they do, they may even choke out the flowers, the vegetables, or whatever other good plants are supposed to be growing there in that garden. And that's kind of like what our new life through baptism is like. In and through baptism, we have died to sin. We've risen to new life. We're like a freshly weeded garden. But the weeds of sin, things like anger, Jealousy, bitterness, resentment, lovelessness, short-temperedness, faithlessness. The list here, we we could just keep going on and on and on. These weeds of sin, they just keep popping up. They're persistent. And if they're not promptly uprooted and pulled out of the soil... They can come to reign and to rule in our lives, overrunning and overruling the new life that we have. So let not sin reign in your mortal bodies 
Paul says. Struggle against it. Weed the garden. Live the new life that God has given to you. Now, this gardening analogy, it's a good one. But Paul here has his own analogy that we can consider as well. Having died with Jesus and risen with Jesus through baptism and having this new life, Paul calls us here in the next verse, chapter, chapter 6, verse 13, he calls us to struggle against our sin by presenting ourselves to God as instruments or tools of righteousness rather than presenting ourselves to sin and as instruments and tools for un righteousness. And what I love about that analogy, that picture, the thought of presenting ourselves to God as instruments or tools of righteousness, what I love about that is that instruments and tools can never accomplish anything on their own or by their own powers. Instruments, for the most part, aside from those, you know, pianos that play themselves, instruments, for the most part, cannot play themselves. They cannot make beautiful music unless a skilled musician is playing them. And tools are very much the same way. Tools cannot accomplish any work or anything by themselves. A skilled craftsman has to wield the tools in order for them to produce anything. And that's how it is for us too. On our own, we can do nothing. But because we have died and risen with Jesus through our baptism, we are free to present ourselves as tools, as instruments through which God will work to accomplish his purposes. In this too, as we present ourselves to God to be used as his instruments or his tools for righteousness, we're struggling against sin. That sin that continues to be there in our mortal bodies, our si that sin which wants to rule over us, we're struggling against it. Because sin wants us to use our bodies, our lives as instruments for unrighteousness. But through baptism, we've been set free and have this new life so that we can present ourselves to God as his tools, his instruments. All of this put together is part just part of the something that God has made out of our nothingness, picking up that idea back from back at Trinity Sunday again, that God has done this through baptism. He's taken us who were hopelessly enslaved to the nothingness of sin, and he's made us to be people who can begin to struggle against sin. But there's still one more verse that we have to consider today, and that's verse 14 of Romans chapter 6. Because in verse 14 of Romans chapter 6, St. Paul says something that is really rather amazing. He says, Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Listen carefully to those words and take them to heart. Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Those words are not a commandment. Those words are not an instruction about what you should do. Those words are completely, totally, 100% a promise. Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. In the new life that we have on account of our baptism, this new life of struggling against sin, the truth is, the reality is, that we often fail. We often do present ourselves as instruments for sin, rather than instruments or tools for the work of God. The weeds do often seem to reign and rule over the garden. But God's work in baptism still stands. We still have this new life. 
sin, the sin that you are called to struggle against, the sin that seems to so often get the upper hand, it will have no dominion, no rule over you, Paul says. It will not reign over you because you are not under law, but under grace. Grace is one of the most important words in the Bible, and it's one that we don't often take much time to think about or understand. Grace means favor, divine favor, God's favor, God's smile, you could say, upon you because of Jesus. God's grace is his favor, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness for you for the sake of Jesus. You are under grace, dear friends in Christ, because you are baptized into Jesus. Because you have died with Jesus and risen from the dead with Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sins. Because God the Father looks at you and sees Jesus, his beloved son, who died and rose again for you. Think about what that means. That means that sin cannot win, cannot rule, cannot have dominion over you because God, by his grace, for the sake of Jesus, stands ready to forgive your sins at every turn. That means that whenever we fail in our struggle, whenever we stumble and fall into sin, whenever the weeds seem to overrun the garden, whenever we fall back into the lives of living as instruments of sin and unrighteousness, we can flee to him. We can return to his throne of grace and find mercy and forgiveness and help for our every need. Do you see how that completely undoes the power of sin? Sin cannot reign, cannot have dominion over you because you stand on account of your baptism into Jesus in the grace of God, in the love, mercy, and forgiveness of God. Does that mean that we don't bother struggling against sin? We say, oh, it doesn't matter anymore? No, of course not. That would be to give up and throw away this new life that God has given to us through baptism. What it means is that as we struggle against sin, and as we often do fail in our struggling, we rejoice. We rejoice to know that we will overcome this sin, this world of sin, this sin that dwells within us, not by our strength, not by anything that we can accomplish, but by God's grace. Because that is who God has made us to be, people who stand in his grace through the water of holy baptism. So that's where we'll leave things for today. We'll continue with this next week and continue to ponder the something that God has made out of our nothingness next week. But for today, we rejoice to be his people through baptism who have new lives, lives in which we struggle against sin and rejoice that sin cannot rule over us because of his grace. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life that is everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your name may be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
May your kingdom come to us, O Lord, and expand. Bring all sinners and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, so that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit, O Lord, according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we command all who are sick or suffering, especially those who are on our prayer list, list from our own parish, for Irma, for Joan, for Floyd, for Gerald, and for Helga, and all others who are in need, praying for them at them now and at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread, O Lord. Preserve us from all greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you for all of our needs. This Father's Day weekend, we especially give thanks to you for our earthly fathers. And as Canada Day approaches, we give thanks to you for the blessings of this land that you have given to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, O Lord, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you so that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, Deliver us from all evil, both of body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join to sing our closing hymn, number 922, Go, My Children, With My Blessing.
去。